the auto recovery position after this presentation if it's necessary. Uh, so, um, yeah, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, my work uh, with John Hughes, who's sat at the front here, um, on the idea of sound within archaeological landscapes um, and talk about a couple of pro two different projects that we've been working on together over the last um, three or four years uh, and to reflect kind of critically on the way in which um, we draw on scientific methodologies and bodies of theory um, and other bodies of theory and whether that's a distinction that is, is really relevant um, in, within the context of our work. Uh, so that's kind of the, the gist of what I'm going to talk about today. So basic structure, I'm going to introduce myself and John, um, talk about uh, our initial project uh, which is called Sonic Horizons of the Mesolithic, um, which sort of focused on Starcar and the Vale of Pickering, before moving on to our more recent ongoing project Soundtracks, which is based at Creswell Crags. Um, and to talk a little bit about um, how those projects have worked, the kind of approaches that we've used and the sort of fundamental questions we're looking to address um, before going on to discuss in a little more detail the, the width and the breadth of different ideas that we draw on um, when we're going about our work uh, before trying to uh, form some conclusions. So just to introduce myself, uh, for people um, who have not met before, uh, my name is Ben Elliott. Uh, I'm a Mesolithic osseous technology specialist, so I've got a PhD in the use of antler in the British Mesolithic. Um, I'm interested in the relationship between human and animals. I like studying uh, the way in which people um, work with and engage with animal remains in a technological perspective um, context because I'm interested in the wider, wider ways in which they engage with animals. Um, and I'm based at the Department of Archaeology up in York. Um, other key player in the project is John Hughes, Dr. John Hughes, who's sat there in front of me, um, who is a composer, has a PhD in compositional practice, um, and has a background in creating um, large scale landscape sound art projects, um, working with all sorts of different people and collaborators, uh, often choreographers, um, working with community choirs, choral work, um, and more kind of sound based and sampling work. Uh, as well, uh, and he's based in the Department of Music at the University of York. So we're we're an interdisciplinary project. Um, the other player in in our in our project uh, at the moment in terms of soundtracks is Professor Mark Evans, um, who's an archaeologist but has quite a, a, a varied background of working in different disciplines as well. So um, before I move on to that, myself and John started talking to each other, um, like I say, about sort of in, in 2012, uh, when I was working on the Star Car project, on the Post Glacial project, um, sorting out the archive uh, for about 10 years worth of field work that had been conducted in the Vale of Pickering, um, both paleo-environmental and archaeological, um, looking at this, this infilled um, lake basin with lots of human activity uh, focused around the early Holocene um, in, within, that, within that landscape. Uh, and in sorting out that archive and chatting to John, um, we started to think about how the work that John does in terms of um, creating pieces of music and composition and sound based on contemporary landscapes might be applied to this archive of an archaeological landscape. Um, and we kind of thought, well, that might be quite interesting. Um, and we both kind of fixed around this idea of, of what life at Star Car, um, this quite sort of iconic early Mesolithic site um, in North Yorkshire, what life at that site might have sounded like and realised that um, although it's not something that many people have considered before, uh, it's actually something that we have a really vast body of archaeological and paleo-environmental data to draw on. Um, and we could use that as a kind of starting point uh, for, for maybe some, some further research questions. So just to give you a, a brief, a very, very brief history of, um, of archaeological and paleo-environmental research with the Vale of Pickering uh, around Lake Flixton. Um, does my mouse work? Um, yeah, so we've got this, uh, this out here is the extents of this, uh, this lake which formed uh, in the early Holocene, uh, the blue areas of water, uh, and through a, a really kind of 30, 40 year program of, um, of survey work, uh, we now know an incredibly large amount of information about this particular spot in the world. Um, so all these red dots here are early Mesolithic settlement sites. Um, famously, you've got Star car with big star over here, but there's a really there's a contemporary landscape of people doing all sorts of different things uh, within in and around this lake. Um, we've got peat deposits which have been cored and augured, um, and we have paleo environmental studies which give us a really detailed understanding of the ways in which this lake formed and changed through time throughout the Mesolithic. And we've also got larger scale excavations which have been carried out around the around the edges of the lake as well, which has given us this huge body of data. Um, and people like Chantal Canella, uh, Barry Taylor, have worked quite extensively on pulling all that data together and giving us a really detailed 
knowledge of what people are doing within that landscape, which is very useful. Um, so the first thing myself and John wanted to do when we were tackling this idea of what, what life at Star Car might have sounded like was to build up an archive of raw material. Um, so we took our species list from the sites in the, in the Vale which have produced uh, faunal remains um, and we went to the British Library Sound Archive um, who were really helpful um, and they hold an archive of sound recordings mainly made for documentary films, so your big Attenborough documentaries every time they, um, they record some sound for those and they'll record hours and hours of sound, they deposit that material with the British, British, um, British Library. So they've got a really cool range of species that you can start to work with and we started to pull that material together. Um, and we also um, worked with exper experimentally to recreate some of the sounds of human activity which we know are being documented um, within the archaeological record, so thinking about antler working, bone working, the sounds of napping, um, the sounds of people sourcing flint on beaches, um, the sounds of fire being set, that kind of material as well, to build up a huge archive of sound recordings which we could link to Star Car in one way or another, one way, shape or form. And we were then kind of faced, or, or more specifically John was faced with the challenge of um, moving from that big archive of sound um, into something that could be processed and, and, and experienced by people today. Um, so the way in which we struck about doing that was using um, Chantelle Canella and Tim Chandler Hall's work on um, basically, basically looking at the, the lithic technology in the Vale of Pickering um, and the way in which different human activities are being played out at different sites around the lake to develop a series of different scenes, so little kind of snapshots, little vignettes of human activity um, around the time of, that Star Car was occupied. Um, and then John used that as a kind of basis to produce a, a 34 minute piece of continuous sound um, which took the listener through these various different scenes and we, we created two sort of fictitious characters, Jack and Amber, who were, who were the key players in those different scenes. Um, so John um, mixed this together, um, this beautiful piece of, of mainly environmental sound but which also encompasses human activity um, and the way John works is to mix things ambisonically. We're very lucky that we've got access to a, a big set of speakers which work outdoors in a huge 30 metre circle which allow you to play back sound in fully immersive 3D. So we're able to create spaces outdoors um, and create a real sense of space within these little um, audio scenes. So we then ran a series of installations around uh, Yorkshire um, in, the, in 2012. Um, here's one outside the, about the, outside the Yorkshire Museum here for the launch of the Star Car exhibition. Um, doing stuff on site in the Vale of Pickering, so during site open days at, at Flixton Island, a, a site just down the road from Star Car, setting up these speakers and, and recreating some of the sounds um, of the early Holocene landscape um, and chatting to people and hearing their responses. Um, also in, in more educational settings, some of the sound was used as ambient sound for the Star Car exhibition as I mentioned before, and as part of the York Festival of Ideas. So we kind of took it out and played it to people and, and had some really, really interesting conversations with uh, members of the public and also archaeologists um, who were listening to the sound and, and, and it got a lot of people thinking about what life would have sounded like in the deep past um, and reflecting a little bit on how that shifts our understanding of some of these key iconic sites. So that kind of wrapped up in about, yeah, towards the end of uh, 2012 um, and we kind of got interested in maybe extending this and looking at different landscapes and tackling different challenges. Um, so uh, we applied for money uh, with Mark Edmonds for a Leave Hume Research Grant um, to take this approach and apply it in, uh, at Creswell Crags, so with the support of uh, Creswell Heritage Trust, this really iconic limestone gorge um, in the East Midlands famed for its Upper Paleolithic archaeology but with a sequence that extends beyond that um, into kind of Neanderthal occupation activities um, and then goes right the way through to um, the current day in terms of its landscape with an industrial mining heritage. Um, so yeah, sorry, we're sort of slightly overstepping the prehistoric bounds of the, of the session here. Um, but yeah, so it's a, it's a gorge with a really, really interesting story um, and it's something that has facilities on site with the Creswell Crags Visitor Centre um, to kind of get that story across to people in, in, in interesting ways. So the, the ream of our project was to provide um, ambient sound for the visitor centre, for the museum and exhibition spaces they have, they have there, um, to maybe um, start running some sound art events within the gorge itself, um, so installations within the cave, um, and also uh, providing a, a temporary exhibition space uh, within the visitor centre as well, um, which would explore the story of the Creswell Gorge. Um, and one of the main focuses of, of this project was to use sound as a primary medium of discourse 
Um, so one of the challenges we found with our previous project that uh, people often struggle to write about sound um, in a way which is kind of engaging and captures the character of the sounds they're trying to write about. Um, and working in the world today uh, where we have all sorts of different ways of disseminating sound to different audiences, um, we felt that we wanted to, to work primarily within sound um, and try to tell as much of, of the research projects as we could um, through sound itself rather than through more conventional forms of academic discourse. So the Creswell Gorge then, very briefly, um, incredible place, uh, it's got an incredible geology, um, it's upper Permian limestone, um, formed through different hyd hydrological uh, processes which have shaped this gorge and also the caves which shoot off from the side of this, uh, th this rather dramatic gorge. As I mentioned before, it's got spectacular archaeology which encompasses the earliest cave art in this country um, and then runs right the way through to the, the relatively recent past. Um, it's also got a history, so it formed part of the Welbeck estate, um, features in some of George Stubbs' famous paintings, um, and that runs through into its more kind of contemporary uh, industrial past and heritage as part of a, as part of a mining, wider mining landscape um, that's had a, a very kind of rocky ride um, through the last uh, sort of couple of decades, really. Um, they also have a, a really interesting oral history archive um, housed at the Creswell Visitor Centre, which has been something that a resource that we've been dipping into through the course of this project. So in terms of tackling um, Creswell, as opposed to tackling Star Car, we were faced with um, a series of challenges. Um, how to communicate changes in sound and sonic environment which occur through deep time. So thinking rather than taking one fixed point within a landscape's history and exploring how it might have sounded, how do we encapsulate changes through time over a large scale? Also changes in space. So how this is, this is not a, a fixed fixed space, this is dynamic, so the cave spaces have changed through time, the gorge itself has changed through time, and how can we go about exploring that through the medium of sound um, within the project? Um, there's also issues of scales, so all these changes operate on different time scales, and how can we work a sense of scale into, into our outputs and into the sound um, outputs that we're producing? More practical considerations, like working with extinct species, so obviously if we're working at Star Car and we want to find the sound of a red deer, um, there's, a, there's a fairly considerable amount of recordings of red deer out there, but if we want to know what the sound of a woolly mammoth sounds like, um, we've got some more kind of uh, pr practical challenges for doing that. Um, and this is a picture of a, an artist, a sculptor called Marguerite Amo, um, who's been creating these incredible uh, replicas of, of mammoth resonating chambers uh, and hooking them up to um, pressurised pressurized air cylinders to play them as instruments. Um, and that's one kind of source, you know, a, a point of contact for trying to explore some of those questions through slightly less conventional means. We've also got the challenge of non-analogous ec ecologies. So the idea of mammoth step and horse step, um, places, uh, types of ecologies which don't exist um, in the, on the planet today, um, and how we can go about exploring those or trying to um, get our heads into those from a sonic perspective. And this idea of fluctuating resolution. So certain periods of the, the gorgeous story we, we understand in very high resolution, and other periods are much less well understood and we lose that kind of resolution as to what kinds of species would have been around and what kind of acoustic ecologies might be playing a role there. So the challenge is working at Creswell. Um, and to try and explore some of those challenges, um, we've tried to sketch out uh, an intellectual space um, to, to sort of address some of those questions that we've kind of very loosely termed uh, the sound fabric. Um, so this is drawing on um, work coming from the sound studies movement. Um, so people who are interested in, in recording uh, soundscapes and analysing soundscapes in both urban and rural environments, um, a movement which got started in the 1970s with the advent of more portable sound recording devices. Off the back of that, there's also the um, acoustic ecology, uh, which is a growing body of work uh, looking at how you can link the acoustic properties of a place or space to its ecological properties. So how um, sound recordings of different environments um, can be analysed to give you an indication of how biodiverse they are, for instance, and how changes in, in the character of sounds of places might indicate changes in, in, in ecology. So acoustic ecology, which is this other emerging field. Compositional practice, so the work that John does, the way in which he brings sound together um, and presents that to other people and thinking about how you can communicate quite complex ideas through the arrangement of sound and the way in which it's presented to, to wider audiences. Uh, cognitive psychology, so think of the words of uh, works of Steve Mills, who's looked at audio scene analysis, and the way in which the brain processes the rare fractures in the air which form the physical content of sound into what we experience within our heads. 
landscape theory, um, ideas of why sound is important within place, um, experimental writing, think about how we can access uh, text and turn what are quite a considerable body of textual resources into sound, and also acoustic engineering. So thinking about um, modelling the properties of the space uh, at Creswell, both within the gorge and within the, the caves themselves, um, thinking about kind of more acoustic engineering techniques which we can use to um, measure decay and reverb, and then thinking about how we can use that within our outputs themselves. Um, so this overall like, overarching idea of a sound fabric, um, which helps us to think about sound through time and in, a, in a particular place or in a particular landscape, draws from all these different fields. We've drawn from all these different fields in developing that, um, and that's been quite important for us to have quite a diverse set of influences feeding into the project. Um, so just to very briefly conclude, because I'm aware I'm sort of running out of time a little bit. Um, the project is derived from a very, very simple question, uh, what do places sound like in the past? Um, and it's, uh, it's a question which is deceptively simple. Um, it's taken us to some quite interesting places in terms of the methods that we're drawing from and the approaches that we're taking. Um, and we've been really open-minded as to where we draw our inspiration and our methodology for, for, for getting to grips with that question. There's no single prime mover within this project. We do not consider ourselves to be a, a science project or an art project or a theory project. Um, I think the one thing that unites all those different approaches is the idea of creative progressive thinking and perhaps maybe when we talk about science and theory um, what we're actually talking about is a way of identifying ourselves rather than drawing hard and fast distinctions between different bodies of knowledge which are meaning, necessarily meaningful. I think that's also why people get quite protective um, and uh, defensive when you start to question uh, the, the validity of, of various different kind of bodies of, of thought. Um, and I think that comes from essentially from the interdisciplinary in our, our approach. So working with people from different disciplines in a kind of open-minded way um, rather than asking a, a specific set of questions and if they do not know the answer to those specific set of questions dismissing them whether that be from you know, various different other academic backgrounds. Um, I think that's a real kind of hallmark of what we're trying to do with soundtracks. Um, and is really kind of we're, we're, we're trying to draw knowledge from different disciplines and feed that into into the work that we produce. Um, so just to conclude there, uh, so knowledge of various funders, the Lever Hume Trust, the British Library, Creswell Heritage Trust, Mark, who's obviously been a fantastic support um, and works with us very closely, um, Cheryl Tip and Frank Stevens, um, who've helped us in various ways throughout the project as well. So we'll go there. Thanks. Thank you.